I just came back from Batroun, uh, paying condolences to Emir Do's family, and uh, I'm going back up tomorrow to attend the funeral. But as it is in this country, even when you're mourning with the relatives and friends of someone you deeply care for, uh, politics enters the conversation. And just outside Marist Fen in Batroun, suddenly people are talking about Hassan Waidet, Tariq Bitar, uh, the port blast, investigation, where things stand, all of that. Um, I thought I'd maybe give uh, my own take on today and what's happening. Let me begin by emphasizing that I spoke to Milhem Khalaf and Najat on Saliba in Parliament uh, on their fifth night, their, uh, their protest, if you will, or their sit-in, although she didn't uh, agree to the term. But let's just say the fifth night they were sleeping in Parliament, whatever you want to call it. Um, I asked Milhem Khalaf, I asked both, to be fair, but I sort of directed the question at Milham Khalaf about the potential for a local investigation working, given that Tariq Bitar had just returned uh, to his work unexpectedly after 15 months. And he uh, emphasized that the local process is paramount and that there's no country without a local process and there's no future without a local investigation or at least a belief in the institution. And uh, Najat On Saliba sort of, in her way, uh, spoke about institution, trust, making a process, making a process, making institutions function, and uh, pushing all the way you can so that institutions work, whether it's by sleeping in parliament and expressing your protest and that there's no president uh, or whatever all of the things that come with the change block and uh, why they're in parliament. I think those two tracks, uh, local pursuit and belief in institutions, um, I challenged them both. Uh, I gave my thoughts and I think it should be said that they are fundamentally wrong, both of them for different reasons. And I say this with respect. I consider them friends at this point. Um, I'm comfortable engaging them, disagreeing with them on air, off air. Public, private, doesn't matter. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable saying this openly. Uh, they're wrong. Let me start with Milham Khalaf. If you want a future for Lebanon, if a future is still worth fighting for in this country, and I believe it is, you need to accept a reality that pushing through a local investigation at this stage now, given everything that's happened, especially what happened today, um, if you're still on that road, you're either finding your space and your political career locked up with the likes of Nabi Hibri and Jibran Basil and trying to sort of press, sort of try, trying to uh, push aside direct criticism of Hezbollah. So this sort of belief in local authority, even when Wafi Safa comes in and says she was a direct threat against Tariq Bitar 16 months ago or so, it's not the point. Focus on local investigations. Okay, fine. Tariq Bitar has not had a local investigation really uh, for the better part of uh, 15 months. And if you exclude the last 24 hours, his work has been stalled. But today is important because what you're seeing now is exactly what paralysis turns into. You have a state that erodes, you get collapse, and then you have this, which is an endless tug of war. Tariq Bitar is a judge within a paralyzed state. He's not a judge in Denmark. So his limits are set by default. 
but he's challenging those limits and good for him. And I agree with Milham Khalaf. He's a, he's a hero for what he's been trying to do. And he's been, I think, delivering his message very carefully and very, uh, very differently in that he shined light on what, what Wafi Safa did and he also let us know where his limits are. Tayune happened, paralysis got worse, uh, he stopped his work as a result. But today or yesterday, whatever, the last 24 hours, he tried once more and look what happens. You're stuck. Except now being stuck is Tar Bitar can linger on in this situation where it's the state suing him, him maybe insisting on staying. And when I say the state suing him, what I really mean is the proxy paralyzed, uh, ungovernable regime that we suffer through. Uh, it can put him in the corner. He insists he won't go anywhere. That's paralysis. And everything gets lost in, in lexicon and, and constitutional decrees and all that stuff. It's BS. That's not even the story. That's just delay tactics. That's wasting everyone's time. The fact is there is no local investigation. And there has been no trust in that process for a long time for good reason. We have a paramilitary proxy army called Hezbollah. If we didn't have that issue in this country, I would bet that a lot of the crimes that are not uh, being investigated right now, they wouldn't have happened. And the ones that are stalled and delayed and pushed aside, that are not directly Hezbollah's fault, we would have gotten answers faster. But this group and its capabilities and its determination to eliminate its opponents in this country and to paralyze any reform attempt that includes its terrain, they fight back. And now what happens is the paralyzed regime that it depends on is fighting for its own survival and does things like what happened today. Stagnation, status quo, and a lot of endless jargon on the side. So Milham Khalaf is wrong. An international investigation and tribunal, should one happen, which I don't think is going to happen, but should one happen, would be the only way forward. That is why we had a tribunal into the attempted and successful political assassinations in 2004 to 2005. That is why we got an answer into who killed Rafiq Hariri. That is why we have a report, a summary, a political explanation for all the reasons those individuals that belong to Hezbollah went after Rafiq Hariri and others. We're not going to get this. Whether it's through a local investigation or the endless uh, poetry that comes out of people like him, Melhem Khalaf. But I do think his belief in the future is right. So, in other words, him wanting the future to be able to... Him wanting a future is... That's, that's right. He wants a state down the road. I do too. But you're never going to get that state with this paralyzing force in the country, period. And Milhem's uh, reluctance for a tribunal, it's actually quite interesting that he thought the tribunal offered nothing. I think he's wrong. Gave us a verdict. Gave us answers. It's the Lebanese state that is unable to arrest those individuals. That's not the tribunal's fault. And that's not a consequence of the tribunal. That's a Lebanese state that's paralyzed by Hezbollah. Linking the tribunal and linking to the state unable to arrest, it's a separate issue. But it's the same burden on Lebanon, meaning you can't have an investigation here that goes anywhere and exposes that group. And you can't arrest individuals with a verdict abroad that points in their direction, offers the answer, and you can't arrest them. The special tribunal cannot come to Lebanon and physically go and chase down these people. It's not their role, that's the Lebanese state. But the first step is accountability, and that's at least having the answer. Who to punish, if we're able to punish them. 
again, the problem is getting that, that huge, huge monster out of the way so that we can have a normal state, a normal country. Maybe I'm beating the dead horse all the time. Maybe I've lost a significant chunk of the audience on the way. But this is the only way forward. There's nothing else going on. We can all uh, end up living in a country that looks like this for the rest of our lives. Or, or wait for regional uh, dynamics to change a bit in Lebanon's favor. But that's wishful thinking. Anyway, I've made my case about proactive diplomacy before. And I've written on this extensively. I've used the podcast to, to sort of animate that as much as possible. But uh, I think it just makes more sense when people in power in this country are speaking that language and offering a constructive message, constructive communication of why Lebanon is stuck where it is. I don't buy into the circular uh, emptiness that has been sold by many with skills that have entered politics, but don't really understand politics. Their skills may be elsewhere, or at least they're not willing to address it for reasons that may have to do with them or may have to do with uh, maybe an un unfounded uh, belief that their voters would turn against them or uh, they're looking to be influential under a rotten regime. So I'm going to leave him alone and go to Najat Salib. She's... Uh, Endlessly believing in the process and the process is paramount, fine. I think she's right. There needs to be a process for a state to function, yes. Um, you can't get there if you're in this situation. Politics didn't start in 2019. Politics didn't start on August 4, 2020. The political problems that have killed reformists and reform attempts and real state sovereignty, meaning the state went after Hezbollah in 2008. Look what happened. The state, the state, in its, in its rubble, Tariq Bitar tried to do a few steps in the right direction. Look what happened in Tayuni. Let me emphasize something as well. Today, it's 15 years ago. A very, very capable, talented officer, intelligence officer, Wissam Haid, was killed for doing his work and providing data for the Special Tribunal for Lebanon that was used by the tribunal that helped them convict Hezbollah operatives. He died 15 years ago today. I would put money on this. No one in the change block, because they're caught up with paralysis, even cares. I don't think they care. For them, it's not the issue. Well, that is the issue. That's a reformer in the state doing his job. And reform needs to include men like him. Standing up for state sovereignty, punishing criminals, getting the truth, accountability, all of that stuff that's not going to happen with a local investigation. So. 15 years ago today, where Sam Aid was killed. We're not going to own up to the reasons he was killed. You can forget about Lebanon. Now, I've made the case, I've made this kind of argument in different ways before, but uh, I think we've reached uh, the end because uh, the wall that everyone needs to climb over. Uh, these MPs, and not just them, obviously, it's many MPs of the opposition too, uh, they're unwilling. They don't have what it takes. They're not willing to risk much, uh, but some of them are looking for a future in this country under its current uh, predicament, and they're looking for power. I unfortunately think Milhem Khalaf has found himself in that situation, although I do think that that's not necessarily the situation he wanted to be in, but maybe he finds no other way to survive politically. 
and he's a new MP. The older MPs have been doing this for too long. Those are the pandering ones that made March 14 look bad later. Um, it's a shame to see these kinds of uh, honorable people, at least at the beginning, end up being uh, regime favorites. But it's not really about him, it's not about Najat, or for that matter, it's not about Tarbitar or Hassan Awaidet. It's about having a governable country that can one day work. And Lebanon, so long as it belongs to a regional, regional problem or regional problems before that hamper that, the solution, the only solution, is to find a way, any way, to get that problem done with. Lebanese resorted to a civil war in 1975. Five years after Fatah's arrival, Kata'ib soldiers are fighting Fatah on the streets of Beirut. Lebanese army disintegrates, hell begins, and militia kill militia. That's not the path forward, but that's an option Hezbollah is providing. That's not the path forward. That would lead to Hezbollah's end and the complete destruction of this country. But the peaceful option forward? Anyone with leverage willing to engage Iran on Lebanon's behalf, given that we can't and we're prevented and we're denied that, should do so. The Lebanese that tried to do that before were killed by Hezbollah. Those that don't have the courage to do so today, maybe that should be explained better to why anyone that talks to Iran and not bringing up Lebanon on the way is really letting this country die. The Lebanese that can still do this are shackled and they're stuck in things that maybe, maybe those that are still in power that think this way are caught up and, and simply don't see their, they don't see a way forward and they don't see the tools necessary to do that. But that should be explained. Change and peace in particular should explain this, that their job is curtailed by this. And that's the case to be made. You can admit that you can't get this problem solved here. That's fine. You can't unless you go to civil war. This flirtation with divorce, if one happens, that's civil war. Partition in Lebanon, real partition, that's civil war gone haywire, meaning a bloody, bloody end to Lebanon and the kind of displacement that you could never put the country back together. But that hasn't happened. And maybe that hasn't happened because Hezbollah still, still depends on a paralyzed state called Lebanon. At least change and peace could make that case and let that message be heard better. That this is why we are where we are. Courageous men like Tari Bitar can only do so much. And he's done all that he can. The change MPs are not being so courageous and what they can do, and what they can say. Hunkering down in parliament and talking about process and local agency, they're missing the story. Or, if I want to be a complete cynic, they're looking to have a political future with bad guys running the show. And that's happened already, and it's getting worse by the day. Or if I want to be more sympathetic and more, maybe, uh, maybe more... Uh, I'll be softer, is that they're simply naive. Who am I to say that, though? They're the ones in Parliament, and it's not just them, but uh, they're naive. I don't think they're ideological. Uh, the ideological crowd, they're sleeping well at night because their career is set. The intelligence crowd the ex-Syria friends, the ex-Assad allies that maybe reluctantly became anti-Assad and are trying to find their foothold, uh, they're the ones that are sleeping well at night. Their, uh, their future is there. And they, they will one day run into the same wall too. They will eventually hit the same wall. But maybe their position is more comfortable given that they don't really want to approach that wall. They don't mind living next to it or defending it when necessary. And 
There's plenty of this in Lebanon. Plenty of it appeared in October 17 as well. Plenty of it, plenty of it uh, is not in power now and wants to be in power. But uh, then that's a country that's just, uh, that's, it's done. There's no future. There's no, there's, no, uh, there's no politics left. It's security and intelligence battling each other. Constructively sometimes they work together. Destructively at times they kill each other. That's not uh, politics. That's just, uh, that's the worst way to end Lebanon. And I think, unfortunately, that's the path we're going. So, good for Talib Itad and what he did. Uh, I think he proved his credentials. Um, I don't expect much for the pandering March 14 crowd. I expected more from the change block, and they didn't deliver. On that note, we Sam Haid is a hero, and uh, we should never forget that the bravest of us paid that ultimate price for a country that sought justice, accountability, believed that the state was hijacked to the point that an international investigation was necessary, the Lebanese state requested one, it got one. A majority coalition called March 14 in 2005. Whether you like it or not, a majority coalition got international assistance. And today, change in opposition could one day get the majority and they probably will never do it. They're not requesting international assistance. The families of the poor blast victims are suffering. They're being led uh, down many 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 delusional roads of of just empty promises and empty rhetoric i think most of them don't buy it and uh good people like william noon and others get arrested get released their brother dies for no reason whatsoever and he's arrested and interrogated and tara bitar is sued i mean there you have it so maybe better for the the, one, the MPs that still believe in the state and its future and the governability of Lebanon, maybe they should stop being so delusional and be a bit more honest about why Lebanon has ended up where it is, which is a failed state and uh, a state that has no hope, no agency, a tormented destiny. <laughs>